Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 9 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is multi collinearity and variable selection. In data mining often we have to deal with big data and then there is a problem which we often face. We have very high dimensional data. And in many problems, the number of variables or the number of dimensions is larger than the total number of cases or the total number of samples. For example, in gene expression data, suppose you are analyzing the gene expression data, then usually you have a very large number of genes and the number of genes is usually much larger than the number of cases or the number of samples which you have. Now, in such cases you would not be able to obtain the least square estimator for the regression parameters. Further, even if the number of observations is larger than the number of variables. Sometimes different covariates are highly correlated and this kind of high correlation leads to unnecessary information. This kind of problem is called the problem of multicollinearity. So, in this lecture we will discuss the problem of multicollinearity, how is it going to affect your estimators or the performance of your model, how it can be measured. We will also discuss the selection, the variable selection procedures which are required when you have a large number of variables which you may like to include in the model or subset of which you may like to include in your model. So, you have a large number of prospective candidates for the covariates to be included in the model. Then your problem is how to select appropriate variables. So, we will discuss this problem also. Now, first we consider the problem of multicollinearity or ill conditioned data matrix. Now, suppose two or more covariates have a high correlation and this kind of high correlation leads to unnecessary information and this unnecessary information leads to adversely affecting the results in a regression model. It adversely affects the performance of your regression model. Now, here are some examples of multicollinearity. Say, suppose uh, you have observations on a person's height and weight. Now, often height and weight are highly correlated. Usually, taller people have more weight also. Then, age and sales price of a car. As the age of a car increases, its selling price decreases. So, the two variables are negatively correlated and the correlation is usually very high. Years in university teaching or in, in fact in any job and annual salary. Again, with the experience usually the annual salary increases. So, there is a high positive correlation 
And suppose uh, while fitting a particular regression model, say regarding the cars, you use both of these variables, age and its selling price. Then you may face the problem of multicollinearity. Then in big data, often the number of covariates is more than the number of observations. So, as I mentioned earlier also, an example is gene expression data. You have a very large number of genes and in fact, the number of genes is usually much, much higher than the number of samples or the number of cases which you consider. Now, suppose uh, x is n cross r matrix of observations on covariate and z is equal to ln x which is of order n cross k where k is equal to r plus 1 and uh, alpha is k cross 1 vector of regression coefficients. So, obviously, the model is y equal to z alpha plus u which we have discussed earlier also. Then suppose rank of z is less than k and this leads to rank of z transpose z less than k. Now, what is the order of z transpose z? This is of order k cross k and its rank is less than k. Now, this is the case of exact multicollinearity. Now, what happens? Since the columns of z are linearly dependent, it makes some of the eigenvalues to be 0. Further, z transpose z is singular because its rank is less than k, whereas its order is k by k. So, it is singular. So, you cannot obtain its inverse, its inverse does not exist. Then the second case is of near multicollinearity. Suppose the rank of z is k, so there is no problem, you can find the inverse of z transpose z, the inverse exists because z transpose z is non-singular. But suppose its determinant is close to 0. So, some of the eigenvalues of z transpose z are very small. Now, this is the expression for the least square estimator of alpha, alpha hat equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose y. Now, if rank of z or rank of z transpose z is less than k, you cannot obtain z transpose z inverse because z transpose z is singular. Again, suppose lambda i and p i for all i equal to 1 to k, these are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of z transpose z. Then you can write z transpose z using the spectral decomposition as summation i equal to 1 to k lambda i p i p i transpose and then its inverse is equal to z transpose z inverse equal to summation i equal to 1 to k 1 upon lambda i p i p i transpose. You can easily verify it. Now, if z transpose z is non-singular, but some of the eigenvalues are very small, then you are having these eigenvalues, small eigenvalue in the denominator. Now, we observe how is it going to affect the performance of your estimator. Alpha hat is equal to z transpose z inverse, which we write as summation i 1 upon lambda i p i p i transpose into z transpose y and variance of alpha hat is equal to sigma square u z transpose z inverse. Again, we write z transpose z inverse as summation 1 upon lambda i p i p i transpose. 
So, in case of near multicollinearity, z transpose z is not singular, but some of the eigenvalues are very small. Then what happens? Now, in this expression for alpha head, lambda i is in the denominator. Now, suppose a particular eigenvalue is very small. Say, suppose lambda k is very small. Then you have an expression of this form and this summation. Now, if lambda k is very small, just a small change in lambda k produces a very large change in this quantity. Or you can say that just a very small change in the data set leads to a large change in alpha head, which should not happen. So, in this sense alpha head is instable or it is not robust. Just a very small change in the data produces a very large change in the estimator of alpha, OLS estimator of alpha. Then alpha is estimated with less precision. Again, lambda i here is in the denominator and if lambda i is a small, 1 upon lambda i is very large, which makes the variances of alpha head or at least some of the components of variance alpha head very large. So, alpha is estimated with less precision and variances of estimators of coefficients corresponding to small eigenvalues are large. Then estimators are often large in magnitude because of small eigenvalues in the denominator often you get large estimators or estimators large in magnitude. Then the consequences are for exact multicollinearity z transpose z becomes singular and least squares estimators cannot be defined. Near multicollinearity leads to estimators with large variances and covariances and hence imprecise estimators of regression coefficients. Now, since variances of individual coefficients are large, in testing significance of regression parameters, the null hypothesis of insignificant regression parameter is often accepted. Remember that while testing the significance of a regression parameter, say ith parameter, the t ratio is beta i head divided by s upon under root lambda i, which is equal to under root lambda i beta i head upon s. And since, since this quantity is small, the t ratio is quite small. Now, this is a contradiction. Individual coefficients are large because of the presence of multicollinearity, but still the hypothesis that the regression coefficient is insignificant is accepted. Even when the coefficients are jointly significant and r square is high, the individual coefficients are not significant. So, even if the performance of the entire regression looks good, the individual parameters are not significant. Then because of large variances of coefficient estimators, the confidence intervals tend to be much wider, since the coefficients have large variances. Then it also leads to estimators which are large in magnitude and often having wrong sign also. Then least square estimators and their variances become very sensitive to small changes in data. Again, the 
expressions for the least square estimators and variances have lambda i's in the denominator. So, if lambda i is a small, the estimator and its variance becomes very sensitive to small changes in data. So, the results are not very robust in this sense. Now, here are some measures of multicollinearity. The first measure is condition number or condition index. Now, suppose we have arranged the eigenvalues in decreasing order. So, lambda 1 is greater than or equal to lambda 2, so on greater than or equal to lambda k. So, lambda 1 is the maximum eigenvalue of z transpose z, lambda k is the minimum eigenvalue of z transpose z. Then the condition number is defined as kappa z equal to lambda 1 upon lambda k to the power half. So, kappa z is a measure of sensitivity of alpha hat to changes in z transpose y or z transpose z. And uh, if you have condition number around 5 to 10, then it implies that your data have weak dependence. So, there is no multicollinearity or the, even if there is slight multicollinearity, it is not going to affect your estimators much. But a condition number around 30 to 100 implies a strong relations or a strong presence of multicollinearity. Another measure is multicollinearity index. We define multicollinearity index as summation j equal to 1 to k lambda k upon lambda j whole square. Notice that the condition number depends upon just two eigenvalues, the minimum one and the maximum one, whereas the multicollinearity index depends upon all the eigenvalues. Here in the numerator you have minimum eigenvalue and then in the denominator you take lambda j and j varying from 1 to k. Then multicollinearity index around 1 indicates high multicollinearity and multicollinearity index greater than 2 indicates little or no multicollinearity. Variance inflation factor. So, suppose R j square is the multiple correlation coefficient between the jth regressor and remaining k minus 1 regressors. So, in all you have k regressors and you obtain the multiple correlation coefficient between the jth regressor and uh, remaining k minus 1 regressors and uh, you calculate these multiple correlation coefficients for all values of j. Then variance inflation factor for the jth variable is 1 upon 1 minus r j square. V i f of 1 means there is no correlation between jth predictor and remaining predictors. And V i f exceeding 4 warrant further investigation. Notice that if r j square is equal to 0, then V i f is 1 of upon 1 minus 0 that is 1. So, V i f of 1 means no correlation and exceeding 4 means warrant further investigation and exceeding 10 means there are serious signs of multicollinearity. Now, we consider variable selection in a regression equation. Now, suppose you are fitting a regression model, then often you have a large number of prospective covariates and your problem is which set of variables you should in include in your model or how to select the variables or covariates to be included in the model. Then overfitting implies too many parameters and inflated variance. As you increase the number of variables or if you are tempted to include 
a large number of variables in the model, then it is going to lead to inflated variance and then you also have too many parameters. Underfitting reduces variance, but it increases the bias. If you do not include some relevant variables which should have been there in the model, then definitely you are going to lose some information and it leads to increase in your bias and regression function leading to poor explanation of data. Definitely you are losing information. So, the explanation of data based on underfitted model is poor. Then a variable is important if dropping it seriously affects prediction accuracy and it is not important if dropping the variable does not affect the prediction accuracy very seriously. Then driving force is Occam's razor means simpler and more easily interpretable is better. Your model has to be simple and you should be able to interpret the model in a simpler way. And then you have to combine it with greater accuracy also because you need accuracy also in prediction. So, you, somewhere you have to compromise between these two options. Now, for selection of variables, we discuss some step wise methods. Uh, there are three methods which we are going to discuss here the backwards elimination, the forwards selection and a hybrid version that incorporate ideas from both. First we consider backward elimination. In backward elimination we initially start with full set of variables, we include all the variables in the model. Then we consider different variables one by one and for we drop all the variables one by one means suppose there are three variables initially we include all the three variables along with the intercept term then we drop x1 fit the model based on x2, x3, we drop x2 fit the model based on x1, x3, we drop x3 based and then fit the model based on x1, x2. And then you have to choose one of the options say either drop x1 or x2 or x3. So, we consider this f ratio which is equal to RSS naught minus RSS 1 divided by degree of freedom f naught minus degree of freedom f 1 upon RSS 1 divided by degree of freedom f 1. Here RSS naught is the residual sum of square for the reduced model and d f naught is the corresponding degrees of freedoms for the residual sum of squares. Say in the previous example, initially you have taken all the three variables. Then suppose you have first dropped x1. Then you calculate RSS naught based upon two variables x2 and x3. Then next you drop x2 say. Then you, you calculate RSS naught based on x1 and x3. Then we drop x3 and we calculate RSS naught based upon x1 and x2. Then RSS1 is the residual sum of square for the larger model, that is the model based upon all the three variables. And then out of these three options, 
for all the three options you have calculated this f ratio and we drop that variable whose f ratio is smallest. So, on the basis of this f ratio you decide whether you have to drop x 1 or x 2 or x 3. Now, the reduced model is a sub model of the larger model. Then again you refit the reduced model and iterate again. Now, you select another variable which you have to drop. Now, if k is the number of variables in the larger model then d f naught is equal to n minus k and d f 1 is equal to n minus k minus 1 because you have dropped one of the variables or equivalently at each stage drop the variable with the smallest t ratio t j equal to beta hat j upon the standard error of beta hat j. And for large n t j follows normal distribution normal 0 1 which is significant at 5 percent level of significance if, if mod of T j is greater than 1.96. Although here I have mentioned the criterion for selecting variables based upon f ratio or t ratio, but you may choose some other criterion also uh, like A i c or B i c using A i c or B i c you may decide which variables you have to drop. So, such variables are dropped from the model and we stop when all variables retained in the model are larger than some predetermined value say f t. And usually we take f t equal to 10 percent points of the f 1 and minus k minus 1 distribution. And uh, in the example actually which we will discuss later on, we are using the model selection criterion A i c for selecting variables. Then in forward selection we start with an empty set of variables means we fit the model just based on the interceptor and k is the number of variables in the smaller model. At each step select that variable with the largest f value. Now, we include the variables one by one calculate the f ratio and we select the variable with the largest f value with d f 1 equal to n minus k minus 2 d f naught equal to n minus k minus 1 and add it to the regression model. Then we refit the enlarged model. So, this is how we proceed in forward selection procedure. Then we stop selecting variables when the f value for each variable not currently in the model is smaller than some predetermined value f e. Then f e usually equal to 2 or 4 or 25 percent points of f 1 and minus k minus 2. Again in this procedure also uh, instead of using the f value you can use some model selection criterion for selecting the variables like A i c or B i c. Now, we come to hybrid stepwise procedure. The hybrid stepwise procedure alternates between backwards and forward selection and then we stop when all variables have either retained for inclusion in the model or removed from the model. There are certain drawbacks of stepwise methods. Say if input variables are highly correlated as in the case of multicollinearity, then stepwise methods can yield confusing conclusions. Say there are two variables say x 3 and x 4 which are highly correlated. Then the stepwise methods are really confusing the method will confuse between x 3 and x 4 whether you have to include x 3 or x 4. 
then maximum or minimum of a set of correlated f statistics is not an f statistic. Remember, uh, you are not directly considering the f statistic, you are considering the maximum of a set of f statistic, which is not a f statistic, it does not follow the f distribution actually but still you are using the critical values from f table. So, the decision rules used to add or drop an input variable can be misleading. Of course, you can form a decision rule based upon AIC or BIC also, which looks uh, more justified also. Because uh, if you are forming the decision rule based upon AIC or BIC, it is properly giving weightage to the penalty part. Then subsets obtained from forward selection backwards elimination may not be the best subsets. Now, this is a big issue and uh, sometimes even the forward selection and backward selection or backward elimination lead to different subsets. Now, if r is greater than n, then backwards elimination is not feasible, because in the backwards elimination, initially we start with all the variables. And since number of variables is greater than the number of observations, your matrix z transpose z is singular and you cannot estimate the regression parameters. So, it is not feasible. Then stepwise procedure produces a specific subset, although several different subsets may be equally good. So, ultimately uh, if you are applying any of these stepwise procedures, whether forward selection or backward elimination, you get a particular subset of variables to be included in the model. But it may happen that there are several different subsets which may be equally good or which may have almost similar predictive power. Uh, now, we consider this example in which we apply stepwise regression to empty cars data set. Uh, remember that we have used the same data set in lecture 7 also for fitting multiple regression model and here we have applied the forward stepwise selection and backward stepwise selection or backward elimination and both direction stepwise selection procedures. And then we have taken miles per gallon or MPG as the response variable and remember that in date this empty cars data set, we had 11 variables. So, one variable we have taken as response variable and all the 10 remaining variables are potential predictor variables. And then we have used a step function of R to perform stepwise selection. Now, first we apply the forward stepwise selection procedure. So, initially we start with intercept only model and then we include the variables one by one. Now, these are the results of different steps and the criterion which has been used here is AIC. So, initially we have used no input variable, just the intercept term. This is the degree of freedom, residuals, uh, deviance, and then this is the value of AIC. Then we have included the variables one by one in the model, and the best variable which has been selected in the first step is. W t and the AIC becomes 
to say. In the next step, W t is already there in the model. We have included one more variable. So, what we do? We include the variables one by one and check the performance of the model or the IC of the model and the variable which has been selected is C y L the number of cylinders and then the A i c becomes approximately 63.2. In the next step, we include the intercept term W t C y L in the model and then we include the variables one by one and select the variable which performs best and the variable is H p. After that, when we incorporate any variable, the performance of the model decreases. So, that is why we stop here. So, this is the best possible option based on the forward stepwise selection. So, again I repeat the steps. Initially, we fit intercept only model. So, this is the AIC fit every possible one predictor model, select model having lowest AIC. So, instead of F ratio here we are using the AIC criterion. Of course, you can use uh, some other criterion also like BIC or Mallow's CP and statistically significant reduction in AIC compared to the intercept only model. This particular step adds the predictor W t and A i c becomes this. Now, we fit every possible two predictor model and then we proceed as before. This adds predictor C y l the number of cylinders and uh, then A i c becomes 63.198. In the next step, we fit every possible three predictor model and then we proceed as earlier. This adds predictor H p and this is the value of A i c. In the next step, we fit every possible four predictor model. Here, none of these models produced a significant reduction in A i c and then this is the reason why we stop here. The procedure is stopped. And once you have selected the variables, then you can simply fit the model and this is the final model. The intercept term is 38.75, the regression coefficient corresponding to W t is minus 3.1669, then the regression coefficient corresponding to C y l is this corresponding to H p is this. Next, we consider backward stepwise selection or backward elimination procedure. Now, here initially we include all the variables, then we drop the variables one by one. So, in the first step, we drop C y l, in the next step we drop V s, then C A R B, gear, D R A T, then displacement D I S P, horsepower H P, uh, then corresponding residuals, model deviance, then E I C, these are also given here. So, how we proceed? We fit a model using all predictors. Initially, we use all the predictors fit all models that contain all but one of the predictors. Select the best among these models. So, we drop uh, the variables one by one, one at a time and then we select the best among these models and then we proceed further. Lastly, select a single best model from among all fitted models using A i c. Then this is the final model. The variables which are included are W t, Q, S e, C and A m and these are the corresponding 
coefficients. Now, we consider both direction step wise selection. Then initially we start with the interception, we include the variables one by one and uh, once you have formed the model on the basis of a set of variables, you also drop the variable which has weakest performance. And uh, here this is the final selected model. So, in this procedure actually you are performing both the steps, you are moving forward as well as you are moving backward, you are including the variables as well as you are dropping the variables. So, these are the steps fit the intercept only model, add predictors sequentially. After adding each predictor, remove predictor that no longer provide an improvement in the model fit. So, at each step you are not only adding the predictor, you are dropping the predictor which now not performing well. Then we repeat the process until a final model is reached. Now, these are the final models using the three procedures. Uh, notice uh, one interesting thing in forward selection procedure and when you are moving both in forward as well as backward direction, you get the same model with the same regression coefficients also. Whereas, for backward elimination procedure, you are getting a different model with different regression coefficients. While fitting multiple regression model, uh, in particular when you have big data and a large number of covariates, which are highly correlated with each other, we face the problem of multicollinearity. So, in this lecture we have discussed the problem of multicollinearity, we also discussed different consequences, how is it going to affect the performance of the estimators or the performance of the model. And then suppose you have a number of covariates as prospective candidates to be used in the model then you require certain model selection procedures which help you in selecting the covariates to be used in the model. We have discussed different uh, model selection procedures, forward selection procedure, backward elimination procedure and a hybrid of two procedures for variable selections. So, I am going to stop here, thank you. of literary snippet. British humour does not have a very high standing in the world. When people talk about it, they usually do so with a certain degree of disparagement. Yet all this is, I think, rather unfortunate because if I read out to you a certain section from Jerome K. Jerome's famous novel Three Men in a Boat, you will realise that not only is British humour genuinely funny, it is probably even better than some of the other samples of humorous writings that you might have read in the recent past. The story that I am going to read out is told by Jerome, who thinks he is suffering from some kind of a malady. A 
I remember going to the British Museum one day to read up the treatment <coughs> for some slight ailment of which I had a touch. <coughs> Hay fever, I fancy it was. I got down the book and read all I came to read. And then, in an unthinking moment, I idly turned the leaves and began to indolently study diseases, generally. I forgot which was the first distemper I plunged into. Some fearful, devastating scourge, I know. And before I had glanced half down the list of premonitory symptoms, it was borne in upon me that I had fairly got it. I sat for a while, frozen with horror, and then in the listlessness of despair, I again turned over the pages. I came to typhoid fever, read the symptoms, discovered that I had typhoid fever. Must have had it for months without knowing it. Wondered what else I had got. Turned up St. Vitus's dance. Found, as I expected, that I had that too. Began to get interested in my case and determined to sift it to the bottom and so started alphabetically. Read up ague and learned that I was sickening from it and that the acute stage would commence in about another fortnight. Bright's disease, I was uh, relieved to find, I had only in a modified form. And uh, so far as that was concerned, I might live for years. Cholera I had with uh, severe complications and uh, diphtheria I seemed to have been born with. I plodded conscientiously through the 26 letters and the only malady I could conclude I had not got was housemaid's knee. I felt rather hurt about this at first. It seemed somehow to be a sort of slight. Why hadn't I got housemaid's knee? Why this invidious reservation? After a while, however, less grasping feelings prevailed. I reflected that I had every other known malady in the pharmacology and I grew less selfish and determined to do without housemaid's knee. Gout in its most malignant stage, it would appear, had seized me without my being aware of it. And zymosis. I had zymosis evidently from boyhood. There were no more diseases after zymosis, uh, so I concluded there was nothing else the matter with me. I sat and pondered. I thought, what an interesting case I must be from a medical point of view. Uh, what an acquisition I should be to a class. Students would have no need to walk the hospitals if they had me. I was a hospital in myself. All they need to do would be to walk around me and, after that, take the diploma. Then I wondered how long I had to live. I tried to examine myself. I felt my pulse. Uh, I could not, at first, feel any pulse at all. Then, all of a sudden, it seemed to start off. I pulled out my watch and timed it. I made it 147 to a minute. I tried to feel my heart. I could not feel my heart. It had been beating, but now it had stopped beating. I have since been induced to come to the opinion that it must have been there all the time and must have been beating, but I cannot 
account for it. I patted myself all over my front from what I call my waist up to my head and uh, I went a bit around each side and a little way up the back. But I could not feel or hear anything. I uh, tried to look at my tongue. I stuck it out as far as ever it would go and I shut one eye and tried to examine it with the other. I could only see the tip and the only thing that I could gain from that was to feel more certain than before that I had scarlet fever. I had walked into the reading room, a happy, healthy man. I crawled out a decrepit wreck. Our friend next visited a doctor and there he got a prescription which said to eat well, to go for long walks and not to worry his heads over things he didn't understand. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. Hi, I'm Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debeyan Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO, that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of five a day. That is, you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately, you could say, 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now, a portion, before we go further, I'll just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium-sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice, which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a five-a-day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five-a-day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies, like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five por 2 portions of fruits and 5 portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators. And if there exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I, will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? 
Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, po three tablespoons of vegetables is equivalent to one portion. So data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK data health survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results apart from that infectious diseases like hiv AIDS, hiv aids etc we found similar for, uh, that our results are not spurious non spurious apart from that we went heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender by age he did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically one should consume more fruits to impact his health, whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting after this, we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication, two policy implication, what matters and exactly how much, how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP. If you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. Uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol, you must consume four to five portions to optimally consume of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little it only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP. And uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off. That means there is something negative happening. It reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. 
and uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. And um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume 5 or more portions of fruits and 5 or more portions of vegetables per day. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health. Apart from that, all size fruits, they have a better impact on your overall health, your mental health, various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol. So, thank you.